The creatures of Unearth are our essence. Thus, it all begins with us, and the power we generate within. I wonder, is there a way to increase this ever-present Eve prior to one's death? If so, how? Is there a limit to how powerful one human might become? My source seemed uneasy with the question. Excerpt from the Journal of Dr. Francisco Amul, Mercia, October 1896 Isaiah Isaiah took the last bite of the fried chicken leg he'd fished out of the garbage, still greasy, crunchy, and flavorless. He'd gotten bored waiting and decided to eat food from Earth, which, with the exception of ice cream, was as good as trash to him. Ugh, why do I do this to myself? With a belch, he tossed the bone aside so a colony of lesser creatures could take what they needed from it. He liked thinking of the little guys. The cloudy sky was lit by a dull moon tinted a warm blue as rainwater drained down the street from a storm that had recently rolled over town, giving the alley floor a reflective shine. Cars sped by, splashing the sidewalks and red-bricked buildings of the sleepy town's business district. The old man, who appeared to be a simple vagrant, had seen nearly every type of village built by mankind since they began doing so. People didn't have houses for a long time, just walked everywhere, from one place to the next, picking up food along the way. Wasn't so bad, really. Nice folks, most of them. However, desert communities like Prescott, Arizona, had fascinated him upon their inception in the 19th century, which seemed only yesterday to him. If there's no water, what are you weirdos doing out here? Then again, much about North America puzzled him. Used to be a quiet place. When people began arriving by the boatful on what Isaiah called the flat but pointy in the middle continent, he first started noticing subtle changes in the eve. They were dreamers, no doubt, but most seemed to be trekking across this new land, looking not for community, but for some sort of isolation. Got real hard to find anyone willing to take me in. Isaiah had grown used to being kicked out of human villages long ago, so it was only mildly surprising that there seemed no place in the developing world for one like him. Humanity and their notions of owning land and picturesque towns in complete isolation, completely free from outside influence, or dirty apples, seemed an element here to stay. Which baffles me, if I'm honest. After all, Humans had found ways to connect and share their written words, voices, and visual ideas all across the globe in only a few centuries, a feat Isaiah never dreamed possible. He was sure peace would finally break out like a plague. But then, following a couple of big wars, most of humanity fell back into their tired old xenophobia, which often had a tendency to spread. After all this time, and all of his fighting, there seemed nothing he could do to help humanity move forward. Even when told the truth about the universe, and I mean the real truth, people in communities like Prescott rarely believed him. And why should they? If life seemed good, why allow in anyone with crazy notions who might wish to take it away? Most simply weren't willing to accept a world existed above their own, populated by beings of their own making. Coincidentally, the idea seemed to conflict the worst with religious types. Despite confessing to many what he really was over the years, always hoping someone might finally believe his tale of the soul, or as he knew it, the Eve, and in return share their own secrets about what it felt like to be the driving force behind it, no one ever came along. Statistically speaking, I should have found something resembling a friend by now. People liked believing what was in front of them, and to the naked eye Isaiah had never looked like much more than an old kook in need of a bar of soap and a pair of clippers but that never stopped him from trying to break the divide between his people and humanity. That's why it's gotta be you, he remembered his old friend, Afton Laffler, saying in his bid to persuade Isaiah to co-sponsor the mandate to send human delegates to Earth, in lieu of representatives from Eros and Hywin. The hope was that it might quell some of the growing tensions in the unearthed Senate and among the unearthed people. Haven't seen everyone this tense for a few thousand years. Since before and furious. To everyone's surprise, especially Isaiah's, the mandate was approved unanimously by the Senate, leaving the responsibility of finding the human delegates to Earth's ranking warden century. Him. It's a lot of nonsense jargon, I know, but should start making sense soon. 
Point is, I don't want to be here and definitely think this is a bad idea. But if it's got to be done, it's got to be me who does it. Presently, taking another look around the drop-off point, where he'd found a stack of empty crates to rest, part of Isaiah wondered if he'd told the unearthed kingdoms the wrong time and place, as he'd been known to do from time to time. Though the incidents were usually spaced out by a few hundred years, give or take a decade. He checked his watch. 11.04 p.m. Still no humans. For crying out loud! No one knew exactly how long it would take for the powers above and below to finish imbuing his chosen human delegates with Eve, which was one small example of the greater problem at large with this particular mandate. No one knew anything. Isaiah could look to neither realm of the afterlife for help. There was no precedent. Letting out a tired sigh, he wished for more horrid human food to distract himself from the fact that the delegates would be arriving soon, with surely nothing but questions and he was the one expected to have answers. In addition, he was tasked with breaking the news to the humans that even though they weren't technically dead, they were going to be treated as such, much like pawns, by a world they never actually knew existed until now. A flash caught his senses. He looked up and sniffed. Wrath was near. What humans are calling hell these days? Using his cane to stand, Isaiah reached into his jacket for half a comb to straighten his scruffy beard and eyebrows and adjusted his gray knitted cap. Unearthed energies rose down the alley at a three-way junction. A blinding strike came and went, lighting the alley and probably half the neighborhood, as a portal opened just large enough for a human. Heat and unbridled wrath poured from the porthole, nearly shoving Isaiah off his feet. A body soared through the hole and landed on the greasy pavement with a paralyzed thud. Before he could reach it, the portal snapped shut with a gasp. You cowards! Can't even face me! Show off your handiwork! Isaiah shouted, shaking a bald fist as he hobbled to meet the body tossed out like garbage. Nearing the man on the ground, whose skin was sizzling, Isaiah knew he was going to hate what he was about to see. Splayed on the ground, eyes closed, was not the angry one, not the soldier, but the teacher. Alex Barker stirred, unconscious. Muscle spasms rolled through his body as though he were being shocked by small, invisible stun guns. Stepping closer, Isaiah smelled him, just to be sure. It was obvious, even to an old Medolian like himself. Alex was soaked in the essence of destruction. He'd been to Eros. Or hell, whatever you call it. I'm so sorry, Mr. Barker. Another train of Eve was fast approaching, rapture this time, the essence of creation. What humans might call heaven, though, I don't know, not really what I'd call it. Place gives me the willies. A similar flash of energy erupted over the alley, freezing Isaiah's gut and forcing everything in the alley to slow in time. Bennett Hunter fell from the portal, landing a few feet from Alex, and the second Eve gate snapped shut placing the alley in darkness. The mortals lay still, their clothes and skin steaming in the cool evening air. Sure, take a nap. That's fine, Isaiah said. Using the opportunity, he held his cane over each of the humans in turn, scanning for possible foul play. They seem all right, and I can sense the seeds of wrath and rapture within them. Though knowing that didn't give him much comfort. Finding a seat to wait as long as necessary, Isaiah pulled his green journal from his jacket to flip through its pages, looking for the right thing to say when they woke up. Some insight, maybe, but came up dry. A moment later, when Bennett began to stir, Isaiah pocketed the book. The larger of the humans groaned, grabbed his side, and curled into a ball, shivering and muttering, Cold. Cold. Please. It'll pass. Isaiah said, unsure if he'd just lied. Bennett opened his eyes and looked around. Where am I? Safe. No longer where you were. Try to stay calm. Breathe some robust, dusty air. See? Good stuff. Isaiah pounded his chest and coughed once. Ugh, freezing. The soldier sounded weak for the first time since Isaiah had met him. It's 79 degrees out. You're okay. Give it time. The old man spotted a shiver in Alex's back and leaned to see under the bill of his blue baseball cap, where his eyes shone white, 
roused, yet distant. Hey, how long you been awake? Can you hear me? The teacher did not react, appearing perpetually terrified. I'm sorry, son. It wasn't supposed to be like that. Isaiah leaned in to take his arm, but when he did, it was like popping a balloon. The teacher's limbs thrashed in a last-ditch effort for survival. Stop! No more burn! Please! Stop! It's coming! He screamed, unaware of his surroundings. Stop! Isaiah managed to hold him steady. Easy. Easy. You're far from there, you hear me? Nowhere near it. The earth has you now. The teacher finally blinked as he took deep breaths, holding Isaiah's arms for support. Did you pull me out? He asked with a raspy voice filled with despair. Thank you. No, don't thank me. Please don't do that, Isaiah said, nearly brought to his knees by the look in Alex's eyes, a look he'd never seen in a human before. They weren't the same eyes of the man he'd met many times over the past few weeks, those of an idealistic elementary school teacher leaving a food mart or stopping at a red light, always ready to give what little he had to those less fortunate. No, these were broken, revealing a mind pushed beyond its earthly limits. Setting Alex against a stack of crates, Isaiah let him rest so he could remember how to use his lungs. By now, Bennett was sitting up. Hello, Isaiah said, followed with a toothy smile full of gaps. Welcome back. Who are you? Bennett asked, reaching into his back pocket for his phone gadget, finding it dead. Electronic devices rarely survive an Eve gate, Isaiah said. Sorry. I know humans these days love their devices, but right now I need you to focus. Are you okay? Does everything feel in place? With your body? Mind? Soul? I want to make sure they put you back together, right? I would have been there personally with you the whole way if they'd let me. But sadly, my jurisdiction is limited to this planet. Bennett hurled his phone to the alley's end, gripped the dumpster, and fought to rise, shoving away Isaiah's helping hands. Get off me, man! Unable to stand, reduced to a crawl, he progressed a few feet before collapsing into a puddle, gripping his side. Ah, oh, look what you did! Isaiah said, picking Bennett up off the ground and laying him against a nearby dumpster. Reaching into his pocket, he produced a gray hanky to wipe him off. I know you! Bennett said, refusing the help. Isaiah smiled. Hope so. Why drink half a bottle of whiskey with someone in an alley if they're just gonna forget you? Bennett looked over his shoulder at Main Street, dropped his chin to his chest, and laughed. This is it. The alley. I never left, huh? Fuck, I drank a lot. What time is it? And who's that? He pointed at Alex, curled up against dairy crates, his tenuous gaze fixed on the ground. Hey, buddy. Bad night, too? Bennett chuckled to himself. Would you believe me if I told you I found you passed out here? Isaiah asked. Bennett shrugged. Wouldn't be the first time. Then that's what happened. You and the other one both passed out, and I'd like to offer my assistance, Isaiah said. I told you earlier, there's nothing you can do to help me. I'll be in jail or Mexico or dead within a week. Frankly, right now, I don't know which I'd pick, so just stay away from me. Seems like we're both bad luck, Bennett said. Isaiah was stumped. This wasn't how he thought this was going to go. Tell you what, let's start over. I've been rude. Never even properly introduced myself to either of you. He switched to a tense foreign accent, intrinsically smooth, unlike any on earth. My name is Isaiah. I think that's about as far as I can remember anymore. I think I've got it written down somewhere. Parents divorced a bit? Bennett asked. I've tried to respect some of the dominant energies that were my parentage. How many people you got in you? Lots, I think. Isaiah answered with a snort. Guess we all do. Bennett was eyeing Alex, currently looking skyward as though following a flock of birds. You sure he's all right? The soldier asked. No, I'm not sure, Isaiah said bluntly. How about you? I feel shitty, so no. Can you elaborate? 
This is the third time you've asked me. What am I supposed to be? Where's my truck? Bennett fought to rise, searching his pockets. Isaiah readied himself in case the need to catch him arose again when a weak voice came up from behind them both. How did we get here? They turned and found Alex looking their way, shivering, but free of the micro-seizures riddling his body. That's a long story, Isaiah replied. One that I'm happy to tell. But first I need you both to come with me. Where? Alex asked. Some place less exposed. No telling who might come looking for the two newest Eve signatures on Earth. We can't afford to let anyone see you fellas and possibly start a panic. Sorry to say, you two have caused quite the stir in my world, and most people aren't too happy about it. What are you... No. What? Shut up. I'm leaving, Bennett said, fighting to remain standing as he took his first steps out of the alley. Won't do you any good. Not now, Isaiah said. The soldier stopped and spun. What do you mean? Isaiah crept towards him, dragging and tapping his cane on the ground. Think, Mr. Hunter. Must be in there somewhere. Go back. Hours. Maybe eons. Not sure what it would be like to a mind like yours. Look, I passed out, had a bad dream, got drunk. Probably still am. It happens. Your truck isn't in the garage. It's still outside the station, Isaiah said. You left the lights on. I turned them off for you and closed the door. You're welcome. Bennett froze in place, his back facing Isaiah. Say that again. The sip and drip? Your father's place? Off Highway 95? Isaiah continued. The shattered picture frames will be a dead giveaway if you return. Hope this isn't too aggressive, but we don't have much time. Bennett faced Isaiah, huffing and letting his inner caveman out. Fuck you, that's something I told you yesterday, right? Now you're using it against me like an asshole. I fell asleep, and... What makes you say that? Isaiah asked. Humans are so volatile sometimes. Because dreams don't become real, and if you die... Bennett went silent as his gaze drifted to the side. How many bullets were in the gun, Bennett? Isaiah asked. Alex looked up. Gun? He sounded dazed, his arms wrapped around his knees. I remember a gun. I remember falling. Isaiah waved his arms as if he were warning a plane not to land. Don't think about it. Think about literally anything else. What happened? Where's my wife? Alex cried. This is going to be jarring. I've been over this a lot, and there seems to be no easy way to do it. Isaiah calmly stepped towards the teacher. What was the last thing you remember on Earth? Alex's brow dipped as if he were fighting an old, unwanted memory. The restaurant? The boy? I thought I was going to die. Only for a moment, Isaiah said in his low, scratchy voice. I was able to get you both before you faded. Though, Bennett, I admit I almost wasn't fast enough to snag you. Rapture still trips me up from time to time. What are you talking about? Snag me? From where? Bennett asked, leaning to join the conversation. Alex felt down his right thigh. No, I felt it. It's complicated. Just because you're on my turf now doesn't mean I understand it, Isaiah said. Tell you the truth, I've always secretly hoped for an opportunity like this. To see someone's face when they don't just hear the truth, but live it. It's never happened. It's so exciting. But in actuality, no. Seeing your faces now reminds me how sad this really is. I'm sorry I have to say this, but Alex Barker didn't survive the night. Isaiah sighed, unable to control his fingers from shaking on his cane's emerald top. Hey buddy, if you're dead, what are you doing here? Go bother someone in the afterlife. Bennett said to Alex. You're going to have to accept it yourself, Mr. Hunter, Isaiah said, or else you'll never be able to do this. Believe me, a lot might be riding on you and Mr. Barker. Cut the bullshit! Isaiah and Bennett spun to Alex. He had one hand on the ground and another gripping a dairy crate, fighting to stand. If you don't make sense in 15 seconds, I'm leaving, the teacher finished, glowering. Isaiah sat on a crate and balanced his hands on his cane. Let me tell you a story about two parties that have traditionally not gotten along and would strongly resemble what you might call heaven and hell. 
Lots of bad blood has been spilled between them, and for a long time neither of them seemed interested in putting a stop to it. Until finally, the feud came to an amicable end, and a, let's say, contract was signed, stating neither kingdom could enter or interfere with Earth. Since then, some years have passed of relative peace. Not many, but some. For the most part, everyone's happy, but contracts need to be upheld, and sometimes situations arise that challenge them. This is why I'm here. I've been sent to procure your services, by any means necessary. Services for what? Bennett asked. And for who? Alex added. I represent a faction of the unearthed government operating out of the tribunal. We are in need of independent delegates who can act as our agents on Earth to find a vigilante archfiend, sorry, demon, known only as Joseph, who's possessed a mortal and refuses to release them. You two fit the bill of our ideal candidates to handle the situation. Isaiah continued under his breath. At least that was the idea. He brightened his face in an attempt to soften the news. Humans love smiling. My order was to find two humans about to die and send them off to be imbued with Eve. The kingdom's methods were allowed to be kept secret, as well as how I found you. In fact, only one provision truly matters. When the demon is found, it must be you two who make the arrest. Bennett spoke to Alex as though Isaiah wasn't present. Anybody ask you if you wanted to be a part of this Greek drama? No, the teacher answered. Me either, Bennett said, stone-faced. Who chose us? Me, I suppose, Isaiah answered. I want to be unchosen, Alex said. Bennett, rushing in with surprising speed for a human, seized Isaiah by the throat and squeezed. I want to wake up, now. More confused than in pain, Isaiah spoke quietly so Alex couldn't hear. Do you remember now, Bennett? Was it five bullets or six? The soldier bared his teeth and released his grip. Stepping back, Isaiah cracked his neck and fixed his dirty coat. I can only say I'm sorry so many times. Nothing will change what happened. Life is life, and it all ends. I'm here to ask you for your help with a small errand before you fade into the eve. Nothing to fear. Simply a formality, and I promise I will do my best to keep you out of harm's way. Alex looked the most inclined to believe. What are you? A medolian. Thank you for asking. Is that like an angel? Isaiah shook his head, thinking they would assume he was the grim reaper before a celestial. A man in a dirty coat is not your first thought for a glorious heavenly creature. Though to be fair, humans had no idea what an angel actually looked like. No, it's not, Isaiah said, standing up. Medolians are balancers. I keep an eye on Earth, making sure everything keeps square. The living universe is like a boat on a tide. I've got to keep it afloat. If one side gets too heavy... Bennett, as a serviceman, you can appreciate following orders, correct? Always hated it. Well, regardless. Does anyone hear that? Alex cut Isaiah off, looking into the distance of the alley, but nothing was there. Sorry. Never mind. Thought someone was... Alex rubbed his eyes, standing with a huff, and started out of the alley, taking slow steps. Where are you going, Mr. Barker? Isaiah asked. Back to my wife. She's not that way. She's behind you. Always will be. Same with the baby. Isaiah said, sorry he had to. No, you're lying. This is all a lie, Alex shouted. I'm going home. With a deep sense of remorse, Isaiah watched Alex, wishing he had the power to change what had happened. But no one does. Sorry, Alex. You're not going to like this. We just don't have the time. Hoisting his cane, Isaiah channeled the malos flowing through his veins, and with a sound like crunching tinfoil, Alex was lifted from the ground, suspended in a near-translucent sphere. Rippling energy coursed along its surface like reflections of light off a soap bubble, tinted a slight apple green. Put me down, the teacher shouted, smacking the enclosure. You got it, boss. With a wave of his hand, Isaiah collapsed the sphere, dropping Alex into a puddle on the alley floor, drawing stares from the humans as though they'd just seen a ghost. Which I've never found particularly scary, to be honest. They're quite boring. Sorry, but I can't let you go, Isaiah said. I know this is all a little strange, and I'll explain everything, 
first we gotta get you fellas someplace safe. You're gonna have to trust me. Why is that? Bennett asked. Because a lot of people are relying on us, and as of now, I'm the only person on your side. Isaiah pointed at his rosy cheeks. Sorry as it is, this was the best face you two could have seen when you woke up. Now, if you'll please hold still, I have a feeling you're not going to like this next bit. <laughs>